I've really loved this study we've been doing, and I think uh, <clears throat> for whatever reason, um, I think this is one of my favorite passages that we've looked at over the course of these uh, last few months as we've been in Matthew. So Matthew chapter number 9, verses 9 through 13. As you find your place, if you will, stand with me as we read the Word. So we looked last week at Jesus healing this paralytic. And in so doing, He's proving that He has the power and the authority to forgive sins. And now we have Matthew here in verse 9, the author of our text, speaking of his, his testimony. We read this in verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, from healing the paralytic, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans or tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go you and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Listen to that last verse. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let us pray. Father, pray this morning that you would re reveal to us Jesus clearly so that we may see his purpose in coming, so that we may see ourselves rightly, and that in seeing the contrast between who we are and who Jesus is, we will see ourselves as the sinners that we are and Jesus as the Savior that he is. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So last week we discussed the truth that Jesus, He came for a purpose. Right? He came for a purpose. And that purpose was what? Ultimately, overarchingly, that purpose was to forgive sins. We looked at the compassion that He extends in offering forgiveness to us. We looked at the authority that He has to actually uh, forgive people. That, it, that it's an actual reality in their lives. When Jesus says, you're forgiven, what are you? You're forgiven, right? He has the authority to say that. We also saw a group of people that, that disputed Jesus' words, calling his claims blasphemous. They didn't believe that Jesus actually had the right nor the authority to forgive sins. We're going to be introduced to these individuals again in our passage uh, this morning. This time Jesus is going to forgive the author of our gospel here, Matthew. A Jewish tax collecting thief and traitor in the eyes of his peers. And the objection that the Pharisees are going to have here is not so much concerning Jesus' authority to forgive, but his association with those that he came to forgive. Last week, they disputed his authority. This week, the ones that he is associating himself with. How could he offer forgiveness to and associate with such sinners? They will ask. All while failing to realize that asking such a question actually puts them outside of the population that Jesus came for. My introductory question this morning is really simple. If Jesus came to forgive sins, who did Jesus come to forgive? The only answer is sinners. And I just want to be honest with you this morning, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you this. This is the best news in the world. That Jesus came to forgive who? Sinners. Why? Why is this the best news in the world? Because you and I ought to recognize 
ourselves as the sinners that we are. And what does this mean for us? It means that we are prime candidates for the salvation that Jesus brings. But there's only one condition here. I think if we read, I think you catch it there. What's the condition? It's if we recognize ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. It's the only qualification that we have to have. He did not come to call those who are well. Ironically, as we will see, there are none that are actually well. He came to call those that are sick. This is really good news. This is really good news if we're honest with ourselves. Now, I think there may be three types of individuals that we have here this morning. There may be sinners that have experienced Jesus' forgiveness. If you are in Christ, that is who you are this morning. You don't drop that label sinner. It's still there. You are simply a sinner that has been redeemed through Christ. You may be in that category. Now, you may be a sinner that has not experienced Jesus' forgiveness. You have never experienced His power in your life to forgive sins and to change your life through the power of His Holy Spirit. You may be in that category. And then there may be those that are self-righteous and simply do not think themselves as sinners and therefore do not need Jesus. The call this morning for sinners who have experienced Jesus' forgiveness is to live in gratitude, thankfulness at what Christ has done for us. But it's also to live with the grace that He has shown us. Be grateful for the grace that He has shown and then extend it to others. That's going to be your call. That's going to be my call this morning. For those that have not experienced Jesus' forgiveness, take hope this morning. Because Jesus is going to make clear, you are the very one that he came to save. So the call for you is simple. It's do what Matthew does here. Repent of your sin, trust in, and follow Jesus. And finally, for the self-righteous who see no need of forgiveness, I know this sounds harsh, But this is what Jesus says. You are outside of the population that Jesus came to save. So this morning, heed his warning. And the call for you is to repent of your sin as well. To trust in and follow Jesus. We'll dive into some application in just a few moments as we get into the text. But now, as we move forward into verse 9, consider who you are. Consider what group you find yourselves in. We read this in verse 9. As Jesus passed forth, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and he followed him. So Jesus moves on from his forgiveness and healing of the paralytic. He passed on from there, still presumably near Capernaum. And he saw this tax collector sitting at his tax Booth. Now, right off the bat, we need to identify Matthew as the writer of this gospel. There's no confusion here. He is the writer of this gospel that we're reading. Before his conversion, however, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, that may not really seem too important for us in our context. I know as we're ending this tax season, we've tried to get all these things together. Um, We may not feel too highly about those that collect our taxes as well. But there were some very hard feelings. There was a deep hatred that ran towards tax collectors in Jesus' day. You see, Matthew was a Jewish man who in Mark is actually identified with a second name, that of Levi. It's quite possible, given that second name that he had, that he was a Levite who would have been acquainted with Jewish tradition, who would have been part of those that were separated 
for service to God. Whether or not that's true or not, Matthew was certainly not serving God in his current occupation. Tax collecting was not a noble uh, job. They were known to charge more uh, than was required. Where he was at, he was probably, uh, uh, it was tax on uh, imports, things that were coming in and going out. So he'd collect more in order to pad his own pockets, right? In order to make himself rich. We're going to see that Matthew was, in a way, a, a very, very wealthy uh, man. And on top of this thievery, what else would they do? Matthew's Jewish peers would despise him for his role in supporting the oppressive Roman government. So those that uh, the Jewish people saw as enemies in their sight, what was this Jewish man doing? Helping them out, right? He was supporting them and also stealing at that. He would be in their eyes a traitor. And then if thievery and treachery are not enough, Matthew would no doubt be in close contact with Gentiles in this trade that he found himself in. It would make him ceremonially defiled due to his relations with them. So he really had a lot of things going against him. To the Jews, he was a traitor. To the Pharisees, he was a sinner. To the Romans, he was a pawn in their empire. But to Jesus, Matthew was a prime candidate for salvation. Do we see that? Do we see that distinction here? To the Jews, he was a traitor. To the Pharisees, a sinner. To the Romans, just simply a pawn in their evil empire. But to Jesus, what was he? A prime candidate for salvation. It's not that Jesus didn't know all this about Matthew. In fact, he knew Matthew better than anyone knew Matthew. But all that he knew about Matthew was what uniquely qualified him to hear that call from Jesus. Follow me. As we will see later, it is the sick who need a physician. All those things that would put Matthew on the outskirts of society is what led to Jesus' call. Follow me. Matthew records nothing other than the fact that at Jesus' call, he rose up and he did what? He followed Jesus. He left that old life behind. A fairly wealthy life, a comfortable life. And it was a life that he couldn't return to. Once he, once he betrayed that occupation, there was no way he was going to go back. He left it all and he followed Jesus. What a testimony we have here, right? Of Matthew. The very one that wrote the words that we are reading this morning, 2,000 years later, was the one, at one time, was a tax collector, a traitor, a thief. It just goes to show what a, what a change following Jesus makes. It wasn't immediate, certainly. It was gradual. But we see... The change, I think it implies, I think it's implied here that Matthew repented of his sins here. It doesn't say that, but I think it's implied. Right? We see that change from a tax collector to one who wrote a gospel that we are reading 2,000 years later. We don't see it explicitly stated, but repentance in its very essence means to turn. To not walk the path that you are currently walking, but to turn 180 degrees and walk in a different direction. That's what repentance means. And this is what Matthew has done. He was on this one track, going towards his own selfish ambition, his own way of life, and what happens? He turned, he repented, and he did, he did what? He followed who? Jesus. That's the call. It's very, very simple. We make salvation very, very much too hard oftentimes. The call was to follow. The call was not, Matthew, get your life together. Clean up, do all these things, and then follow me. I'll come back in a couple of months when you have everything together, and then if you've, if you've, if you've got it cleaned up enough, then I'll come along and help you and you can follow me after that. No, the call was very, very simple. It was Matthew, now. 
right this minute, follow me. And Matthew followed. There's a sense in which I think the call for those who have never experienced Jesus' forgiveness is to simply, at His command, follow. You're to repent of your life of sin, certainly. But as you follow Jesus, you will progressively become more like Him. Again, I think it's... Sometimes we make it way too hard to follow Jesus. It is hard in the sense that it calls us to leave our old life behind, but notice the simplicity in Matthew's call. The call, again, is not for Matthew to jump through a bunch of hoops. It's simply to follow Jesus and learn from Him. In other parts, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. I think oftentimes the hold up For individuals, if you're in that category where you are a sinner, you know yourself to be a sinner, but you have never experienced the forgiveness of Jesus. I think the hold up oftentimes is that you've been told your whole life that you don't measure up. Maybe from people in the church. You've been told your whole life you're just not simply, you're simply not good enough. You're not clean enough. Right? You're too far gone. You need to do this. You need to do that. You're just, you're just simply not there. The result of this kind of evangelism, this kind of preaching, is devastating. People give up hope. Right? People give up hope. They're not, they're not good enough. There's nothing they can do about it. So they give up hope. But let me be clear, this is the place where you have the most hope. Because this is the only place where Jesus meets people. When they realize that they are not good enough. That they're not clean enough. That there's nothing, there's simply nothing that they can do about it. That is the only location that Jesus meets you in. Is the only condition that Jesus meets you in. Look, we try to run from Jesus in many different ways. We try to run from Jesus by being good and not thinking that we need His salvation, but we also run in many ways by being bad. That first one is far worse. Understand, when you get to the end of hoping in yourself, your own goodness your own status, that's a good place to be in. Because it's only in that condition that Jesus comes and meets you. And what we see next, I think, reveals to us that this was not just a one-off for Jesus. Matthew didn't just come to this lonely sinner, or Jesus didn't come to Matthew, this lonely sinner, and simply nobody else. Moreover, it was not that Jesus simply forgave Matthew and had no intentions of a life with him. What we see next is that Jesus actually goes with Matthew to his home to meet with him, to eat with him, to meet with his friends, to eat with his friends who were described as tax collectors and sinners. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, he talks about, I don't have the exact quote, but he talks about how oftentimes we view Jesus' salvation as a little kid touching a bug. They're hesitant, right? Because that bug is nasty, it's slimy, it's dirty. They want to touch it, but they're hesitant, right? They, They pull back, they scream when they touch something that is unclean. That is not how Jesus approaches us. That is not how Jesus approaches the unclean. He is not scared to reach out to those that society despises. What does He do? He comes before them and He eats with them. We see it in verses 10-11. through Mark and Luke 
Both record that Jesus, he goes to Matthew's house, and Matthew simply uh, implies it in his gospel. But it's there, Matthew tells us that Jesus, he reclined at the table in the house. He reclined there. He ate with these individuals. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. I think we have a tendency to read this and think, well, Jesus and his disciples must have been really uncomfortable in that morning, or in that moment, right? Reclining with all these tax collectors and sinners, reclining with the bad crowd, the people that society doesn't really like. Almost in the sense that Jesus didn't really want to be there, he just felt obligation to be there. We have no hint of that here in Matthew's Gospel. There's no hesitation. There's no lack of desire on Jesus' part. In fact, the language suggests intimacy here. To recline at table, to share a meal with someone or a group of people is a sign of intimacy, a sign of association, a sign of relationship. In other words, we can say it like this, Jesus and his disciples were not ashamed. They were readily available to identify themselves with the very ones that society deemed undesirable. And we know this to be true. The gospel writers, they record other occasions where Jesus does the same thing. Right? Luke, before recording the parable of the prodigal son, he mentions that the Pharisees and the scribes were upset. And then he tells that parable. Why were they upset? Because the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to Jesus. There was something about Jesus that drew them near. Why? Because he would receive them. He would eat with them. He didn't treat them like society treated them. Luke also records for us Jesus' interaction with another tax collector, Zacchaeus. We know him as the wee, the, the wee little man, right, that climbed up in the tree. Jesus calls Zacchaeus to come down from the tree. And why? Jesus says, I must eat at your house tonight. I must be with you today, Zacchaeus. And what does Zacchaeus do? He comes down and he joyfully receives Jesus. But what happens in the midst of that? It says those that were there and witnessed this, they did what? They rejoiced over the fact that a sinner had come to Jesus? No, they grumbled. They grumbled. Why? Because Jesus wanted to associate himself with sinners. They said he has gone in to be the guest of a man that is a sinner. They grumbled. They complained. Question is, why is this such a bad thing to the Pharisees? To eat with tax collectors and sinners. Why don't we see it as such a bad thing in our society today? Why don't we see it as a bad thing in the church? Well, I think it's found in the meaning of the phrase tax collectors and sinners. We already know about Jesus' affiliation with tax collectors and why that was so offensive, but what about sinners? Sinners could simply refer to those that didn't share the opinion of the Pharisees and all their strict Rules and regulations, simply put, common people of the day. However, as Nolan writes, he says, sinners here should be understood primarily sociologically as identifying those publicly known to be unsavory types who live beyond the edge of respectable society. You know the type? I say type with quotations. The people that ultra-religious, self-righteous individuals tell you not to hang around, right? Maybe you've been identified as that person before. I'm sure I have at some point. The fear is that what? They'll make you unclean, right? They'll make you unclean. They'll ruin your reputation. It's the same fear that the Pharisees had. Communion with these individuals would render them what? Unclean. It had rendered Jesus unclean, apparently. His disciples unclean. But Jesus didn't come to garner or protect a good reputation. That's not what he came for. He came to save sinners, of which you and I are chief. He didn't come to protect a reputation. He came to redeem. 
It doesn't take too long to recall to mind incidents like this in my life. I'm sure it doesn't in your own life. I know from experience I've had people tell me you shouldn't be hanging around with them people. You shouldn't be hanging around that type of people or that person. I, I've legitimately had people say, don't you know that your, your reputation as a pastor is on the line? I don't care. Your reputation is on the line. What is people going to say if they see you there? If they see you in that bar, if they see you with them people that are out doing all them things, what are people going to say? I get that we're to be, as Christians, above reproach, but if your idea of being above reproach means never being with sinners, then you're asking for a standard that Jesus never set for his own self. Moreover, if you're more concerned about your reputation than the souls of other people, then you're simply out of line with the mission of Jesus. You're out of step. And you're actually outside of the population that Jesus came to save. But I'm not going to sit here and act like I've never had moments where I've acted like this. I have. I regret certain things in my life. I regret sin in my life. One of the biggest regrets that I have in my Christian life is a moment where I looked at a friend who was doing something that I didn't approve of. And I said, I'd, I'd never do that. I, I'll never do that. Why? Because I'm a good Christian. I said that. And I regret it to this very day. I, I, it pops up into my mind at random times. Maybe as a reminder to me that that is heresy, that is dangerous, and that is not the attitude of Jesus. I regret that. I can't do anything about it now, but I regret it. Listen, to act as though I deserve the grace that Christ had shown me was immaturity at best and a blatant disregard of my need for Christ at worst. When we put ourselves above that category of sinners, we're putting ourselves outside of the population that Jesus came to save. Listen, until we see ourselves as the biggest sinners we know, we will never truly be grateful for the grace that Christ has shown to us. This should be a natural occurrence for genuine believers in Christ. Carson describes it like this. He, he describes it as the aftermath of even uh, uh, Christ. He says that the common aftermath of conversion is this. The euphoria, that, that feeling of, of that, that, that great feeling that you have right after your salvation, he says, typically, it dissipates. It goes away to be replaced by a puzzling and growing sense of sin. Genuine Christians recognize that they are, are, they are sinners. The reasons he continues, is he says this, growing conformity to Jesus Christ, the powerful work of the Spirit within us, soon shows us the level of our self-centeredness. But this is good because as he concludes, our growing awareness of the magnitude of our sin can only result in growing thankfulness for the riches of the pardon that we have received. In this we are to rejoice. In this we are to be thankful that Christ has looked down upon us lowly sinners and redeemed us. We should feel a growing sense of sin. As we, as we get closer to Christ, as we grow in conformity to Him, we should be like Paul, who says, what, I am the chief of sinners. And when he says that, he says, I, it's not that I was the chief of sinners and I came to Christ and I'm not a sinner anymore. He says, I am currently Still the chief of sinners. Right? Christ has saved me. I'm writing all these books in the New Testament. Well, what? I'm still the most vile sinner that I know. This ought to be the attitude that we all have. We are to be... It's only then that we can be grateful for the, the grace that Christ has shown us. 
But we're not simply just to be grateful. We're also to emulate Jesus' example here. The grace that he has shown. A growing understanding of our own sinfulness should spark in us a humility that never allows us to see ourselves as better than other people. Or as too good to stoop to someone else's level. Why? Because we're on that level too. As Carson writes, Christians can never afford to adopt haughty stances toward other sinners. Listen to what he says. We are never more than poor beggars telling others where there is bread. When we feel like we deserve that bread, we haven't experienced Jesus. We are never more than poor beggars telling others where there is bread. And I want to be clear here. When I say hanging around people that may not be our brothers and sisters in Christ, these people that maybe the self-righteous don't deem appropriate for us to hang out with, let me be clear. I'm not saying that we do this in a sneaky sort of bait-and-switch way where the only reason we're there is that hopefully they'll come to know Christ. That's part of it. We want to see people come to know Christ. But if you don't genuinely love and care for someone regardless of whether or not they ever come to know Christ, they're going to see right through that. They're going to see right through that. The goal is not to love people with ulterior motives. The goal is to love people, period. But the Pharisees, they didn't see it this way. They were righteous in their own eyes. They would not stoop to the level of tax collectors and sinners. But it's in this that we see their ultimate problem. Their ultimate problem. This is perhaps the most dangerous position that one can be in. This position of, I've been going to church for 30 years. I don't miss Sunday school. I've read through the Bible, I don't know how many times at this point. But you can still go out and gossip about people. Still go out and shame other people. Still go out and have sin all throughout your life. That's a dangerous position to be in. Thinking that you were justified. But you're justified simply in your own eyes. It's a very dangerous position to be in. This was the position that the Pharisees were in. They didn't recognize themselves as sinners and they simply didn't need the mercy of Jesus. They asked Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus overhears it and he responds, those that are well, they don't need a physician. Who needs a physician? Who needs to go to the doctor? When do you go to the doctor? You go when you're what? When you're sick. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come to call the righteous, or not the righteous, but sinners. According to the Pharisees, they were simply not to be categorized with the sinners. They were the good guys. They were the ones that knew more Scripture than anybody else, right? Moreover, they obeyed Scripture better than anybody else. They did the right things. They said the right things. But none of them ever came to the same conclusion that Paul did. Paul tells us multiple times, he tells us in Philippians, if anyone can boast in the flesh, it's me. Right? Paul says, if anyone can do it, I can. I am better than all the Pharisees. I'm a better Jew than all the Jews. Right? He, he says, I am all of these things. But what does Paul come to the conclusion? Whatever gain I had, I counted all as loss. Why? For the sake of Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Paul knew that he needed a deeper righteousness. He needed an inner righteousness. He needed a righteousness that was of not himself. He needed a foreign righteousness. An applied righteousness. He needed Jesus' righteousness. But the Pharisees, they had their own righteousness, which in their eyes was simply good enough. They didn't need saving. They simply needed validation from Jesus that they were good enough, right? That was their idea of a Messiah that would come, crush sinners and validate the ones that were good enough. 
they're not going to find that validation from Jesus. This attitude, in fact, is precisely what disqualified them from experiencing Jesus' forgiveness and salvation. Jesus tells them, they that be whole need not a physician. Jesus is referring here to the Pharisees when he say, they, says, says those that be whole. And then later on when he says, I am not come to call the righteous but sinners, he is categorizing the Pharisees with the righteous. So it seems odd on the surface. It seems like Jesus is saying that the Pharisees are somehow genuinely righteous apart from Jesus. But this is simply not what Jesus is saying. Elsewhere we see Jesus' statement concerning the insufficiency of the Pharisees' righteousness. Matthew 5.20, Jesus says this, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. You need a, a, a greater righteousness, a different righteousness than the ones that the scribes and the Pharisees have. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is simply pointing out the view that the Pharisees have of themselves. Right? And in their self-designation of righteous and not sinners, they exclude themselves. Why is this? Because He came for who? The sick. He came for sinners only. Truly, the Pharisees are sinners as well, and Jesus knows this. There's not two categories of people here, sinners and non-sinners. There's only one category of people in this world. If you are a human... You are in that category of sinners. That's what David said, wasn't it? Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We read throughout Scripture that there is none that, is, that are righteous. No, not even one. Paul tells us about how through Adam, sin passed to all mankind. If you are a human... You are in that category of sinners. Carson says this, When today those who promote themselves as righteous view religion through the prism of their self-justification, Jesus says, in effect, that He did not come for you. That's a hard word, isn't it? We like this idea of, of stepping on people's toes, don't we? And we oftentimes see that through the lens of, I've got some kind of sin in my life. You've stepped on my toes. You've revealed that I'm going to go confess. But what about stepping on toes when it comes to self-righteousness? When it comes to this attitude that, well, you know, I kind of have all these things going for me. I've got all these good works. I do all this stuff. Jesus simply comes alongside and helps me where we don't see ourselves as the sinners that we truly are. This is a hard saying of Jesus. He is saying, if you see yourselves above that category of sinners, I actually didn't come for you. It's more dangerous to be on that side, isn't it? Where you have no realization in your life that you are a sinner. And that you are simply justified because of all the good things that you do. There is nothing that you and I as sinners can do that can ever put us on the standard that God has set for us. There is only one person that has ever came that has, that has lived that standard. And Jesus is saying, because of that, I want my righteousness to be applied to you. You don't need your own righteousness. Your own righteousness is filthy rags. You need my righteousness. It's interesting how Jesus rebukes the Pharisees here. These are individuals who should know the Scriptures, right? Who claim to know the Scriptures. And Jesus says, go and learn the Scripture. Go and learn what it means. And He quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What is, what is He talking about here? Well, if we, if we remember Hosea, Hosea uh, was a prophet, and God told him to marry what? Or who? Gomer, who, who was what? In the, in the Scripture, it says, a wife of whoredom. What this means is she was a prostitute. Gomer was to marry her, to be faithful to her. Why? Because it pictured the relationship that God had with Israel. God was a covenant-keeping God. 
He was going to remain with Israel regardless of the fact that they go out and worship other gods. And what are they doing in the midst of all this? They're coming to the temple. They're making their sacrifices. They're doing all these things that, that God's told them to do. But God is essentially saying, you're missing the point. These sacrifices that you are doing, all these things that I've set for you, is in order that you may know me. You're missing the point because what you're doing is you're making all these sacrifices, you're doing all these things, but you don't know me. And if you did, you wouldn't go about whoring after these other gods that in fact are actually not gods. This is what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here. You say you do all these things, but you don't know me. You don't know me. You have no inner righteousness. What Jesus is saying is that all of these, all of this law, all these scriptures, they were, they were to point to me. And I'm here in your presence. I'm here in your presence and you're rejecting me. The truth is that the Pharisees, their obedience, it didn't make a difference in their life. It didn't change them. If it had, they would have been right there with Jesus. They would have been right there eating alongside of the sinners. Of which they would recognize themselves to be the biggest sinners. Jesus tells them, you've missed the point. He says, I haven't come to destroy sinners and to validate you as good enough. In fact, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, all are in need of mercy, even you yourselves. But the Pharisees wouldn't recognize it. I wonder, are we in that position? It's a, da it's a dangerous place to be in. Where we see ourselves as good enough. Where we just need a little bit of Jesus, right? We just need a little bit of Jesus. We got the rest. I want to conclude by looking at John chapter number 8. So I think what we can sometimes get confused with here is that we often think what I'm saying in all this, what Jesus is saying in all this, is that he goes in with these tax collectors and sinners and he validates them. That he says, it's okay what you're doing. And that he sort of joins in on it, right? And he reveals to them that there's no sort of need for, for a change in life in their own life. But this is simply not so. I think in John 8, 1 through 11, we have a good understanding of the relationship that Jesus has with sinners. Again, and, and listen, when I say sinners, I'm talking about everyone. I'm not talking about a specific category. I'm talking about every single person. Let, let us, if nothing else, I know this is a rant, but if nothing else, if you go away with nothing else this morning, go away with the fact that you're a sinner. If you've been in church for 30 years, go away with the fact that you're a sinner in need of Jesus. If that's the only thing you go away with, great. If that's the only thing that you can comprehend or, or, or take away and, and remember from this passage is that you're a sinner in need of Jesus, that's great. So when I'm saying sinner here, I'm not speaking just about this woman here that is caught in adultery. I'm speaking also about those that would look on a woman with lust, right? We read about that a little bit in the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone needs a different type of righteousness. And listen to what he says here. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came into him, and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. 
Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they were tempting Jesus here, right? This they said, tempting him, but they might, have acute to, uh, might be able to accuse him. But what did Jesus do? Jesus, he stooped down and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he had heard them. Or as though he had not heard them. So when they continued asking him, what did he say? He lifted up himself and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even into the last. And who was left alone standing? The only one without sin. Jesus. The only one who has any right to say what should be done to this woman. The sinless one. And what does he say to her? Listen. When Jesus lifted up himself and he saw none but the woman standing there, he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No, no man has, Lord. And what does Jesus say? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and what? And sin no more. Go and sin no more. Why did Jesus come into this world? If you want to, flip with me to 3. John 3. Our favorite passage. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to do what to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved this morning I don't know your condition I I don't know what category you find yourself in But I do know that if you are in that category of sinner who is reconciled to Jesus, rejoice and be glad this morning. But go out and also show grace. Jesus was without sin. And what did he do? He went out and showed grace to sinners. This morning, if you're in that category of, I I am a sinner, I know myself to be a sinner, but I've never experienced the reconciliation that Jesus brings in my life. What is the call for you? If you're in that position, if you feel like there is no hope, listen, take heart because it is in that very condition that Jesus meets you. There is no other condition that Jesus will meet you. Because if you're in that condition of, I'm good enough, I've done enough, I just need a little bit of Jesus, you're outside of the condition that Jesus meets. So take hope in the fact that you're a sinner. Not take hope in your sin. Take hope in the fact that as a sinner, Jesus has come to save you. So if you are in that category, the call for you is simple this morning. Repent. Turn from that life that you are currently living and follow after Jesus. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect. You're still going to be a sinner, but you're going to be a redeemed sinner. One that grows more and more like Christ as you progress throughout this life. Where sin is going to become disgusting to you. Where sin is going to gradually become more obvious in your eyes, but you will be able to gradually kill it through the Spirit. This is the change that Christ brings in a person's life. And finally, if you are in that category where you see yourself as above the need of Jesus... That is the most dangerous place you could possibly be in this morning. The call for you is to search the Scriptures. To understand the fact that there is no one that is righteous. No, not one. The whole story of this Bible here, the whole story of the Scripture, from the very beginning to the very end, tells a story that we humans are fallen. 
that we are sinful and there is absolutely nothing that we can do to rescue ourselves. But the good news, the good news of this scripture on every page is the fact that even while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. We are all in need of that. And this morning, the invitation is open. Jesus is still calling people today through the power of His Holy Spirit. And simply put, this morning, if He is calling you, don't ignore it. You don't have to clean yourself up. Don't ignore it. Do what Matthew did. Simply follow Him. Follow Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word that shows us that You are a gracious Heavenly Father. That before the foundations of the world, You had set in place a rescue plan to redeem sinners of which we all are. God, help us never get to a position in our lives or in this church where we see ourselves as above the category of tax collector and sinner. We are in that category. And while we are in that category, that is what puts us in the position to be saved and to be sanctified through Christ. Help us not to revel in our sin or sin so that grace may abound. Help us to see the ultimate penalty that our sin resulted in the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But help us to see that through His death and resurrection, He has the power, He has the authority to forgive us of our sins, to reconcile us, and to make us clean. Father, we thank You for loving us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.